characterize the basic building blocks of education. And for him, it was really important, as Jean was saying, to situate philanthropy in the context of an understanding of human nature, an understanding that what it was itself nuanced and complex. Quoting William James, the pessimist is convinced that the salvation of the world is impossible. The optimist is convinced that the salvation of the world is inevitable. To neither of these perspectives does philanthropy make any sense. Everything's going to be okay. Who needs voluntary action for the common good? We're all sunk. <laughs> What's the point of voluntary action for the common good? <laughs> Out of an understanding of human nature and this particular complex and nuanced understanding of human nature, philanthropy becomes significant and worthy of study. But you have to start back before philanthropy. It's not as though philanthropy just sort of exists and then we're going to go study it. Philanthropy emerges from an understanding of people. In his retirement, perhaps before his retirement, uh, he had some concerns about how higher education was evolving in the United States at the turn of this century. Being Bob, he did not keep his concerns to himself. All of this, his commitment to education, his concern for education, reflected Bob Payton, the person, a fierce devotion to reason on the one hand, a fierce devotion to reason. This is not a sentimental guy. A fierce devotion to reason on the one hand, coupled, however, with his compassion on the other, high expectations for himself and for others, yet a person who had dealt with loss and tragedy and who understood, therefore, both the strengths and the frailties of human beings and the fragility of our place on this planet. He has already received many encomiums since his passing in print as well as here this afternoon. Were he here, I think he might be starting to get a little frustrated by now. <clears throat> yes, that's all nice, he might say. I'm glad you liked it. I'm glad you liked what I had to say. I'm glad you liked what I did. But the question now is, what are you going to do? And for our school, the answer is simple, though the challenge it presents is not. We will educate through ideas and talk about the great questions and puzzles of human existence about the challenges and opportunities of living together and socially, about the obligations we have not only to others but to ourselves, about our capabilities as well as our limits and the need to make the most of the former despite the latter, about the importance of using your time here fully and wisely and well and making a difference and leaving the place at least a little better off than it was when you showed up, like he did. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Warren Ilshman, former director of the center. Well, I had the privilege of succeeding Bob Payton as director of the Indiana Center on Philanthropy. My feeling of privilege came from many sources the vitality of the mission he created, the quality of the institution he established, the abilities of those he appointed and encouraged. But the chief source of that sense of privilege is what I learned from Bob weekly over lunch, same menu each time, cob salad and copious amounts of iced tea. I think of it as my second liberal arts education. Indeed, after the usual pleasantries, at our first lunch, 
He asked if I more often came down on the side of Plato or on the side of Aristotle. <laughs> I bravely said Aristotle. Thereafter, every week, in addition to our common agenda, we talked about books, writers, and thoughts. Some of his phrases I've used over and over in later responsibilities. Life is a search for hope, purpose, and meaning. I say that's often to my children. They say, oh, Dad, not HPM again. <laughs> Another one, tell me about your philanthropic autobiography. A third one, what is not on your resume that makes you what you are? And finally, the history of philanthropy is the history of the moral imagination. Let me read from a favorite quote of his from Cicero's On Duties. In the quote, Cicero mentions Ennius, a poet who lived a century earlier. Quote, Cicero On Duties. The most widespread fellowship existing among men is that of all with all others. Here we must preserve the communal sharing of all the things that nature brings forth for the common use of mankind in such a way that whatever is assigned by statutes and civil law should remain in such possession as those laws may have laid down. But the rest should be regarded as the great proverb has it, everything in common among friends. The things that are common to all seem to be the kind of things that Ennius defines in one case from which we can extrapolate many cases. A man who kindly shows the path to someone who is lost lights another's light from his own. For his shines no less bright because he has lit another's. With this one instance, he advises us that if any assistance can be provided without detriment to oneself, it should be given even to a stranger. I now have a privilege of introducing someone who is not a stranger. I'd like to introduce uh, Patrick Rooney, the present director of the center. Well, we have the successor and the successor to the successor, and I'm the successor to the successor to the successor. Uh, so we have a, a full legacy of Bob's successors here at the Center in Philanthropy. Um, this is not in my script of remarks, so I'll get kicked for this later. But since um, Michael brought up when everyone met Bob the first time, and, and I will just very briefly uh, say that uh, those of you who know me, I'm a data wonk. I'm an economist by training, and I love data. I love data a lot. In fact, I'm more likely to remember your social security number than your name. <laughs> it's a problem. <laughs> the first time Bob came to my office uh, when I became the director of research, he said, and kind of wagged his finger at me a little bit, and said, now, don't forget the humanities. And it was an important statement. And, and we've been careful, I've been careful, to remember that as well. All right, now to the formal remarks. <laughs> Sorry. Um, if a legacy is defined as the impact of one life on the lives of others, then Bob Payton's legacy is extensive and enduring. It's been almost two decades since Bob led the center on philanthropy, but his impact on the center and on philanthropy generally remains evident in our work today and indeed throughout the philanthropic world. Bob was a pioneer and from the start, ensured that the, that the Center on Philanthropy would be a national and an international pioneer as well. As the Center's first full-time executive director, he led its development into the world's premier institution for the study of philanthropy. Bob established philanthropy as a field worthy of serious intellectual study. He led the creation of philanthropic studies. He advocated for and mentored centers and programs at other universities around the world. Today, as Gene noted, there are several hundred programs like this in other countries and at other universities in the United States. Thanks to the foundation that Bob laid, universities around the world continue to turn to the Center on Philanthropy, both as a model for education, but
but for thoughtful and ethical philanthropy practices. This model began with the Jane Adams and Andrew Carnegie Fellows Program, which Bob founded. The JAF Program, as it has become known, uh, became the basis for the center's respected academic degree, degree programs. Because of Bob's foresight, people around the world continue to see the center as the best place to get this unique form of education. Bob helped to develop and launch the world's first Masters of Arts in Philanthropic Studies degree program almost 20 years ago. With our colleagues in SPIA, he helped launch the P Masters of Public Affairs and Nonprofit Management program. Under his leadership, the center created the Indiana University Press and Philanthropic Studies book series, an ongoing source of textbook and resources. Understanding the theory and practice strengthen each other, Bob established a center as a nationally respected convener, a place where scholars and practitioners would meet and learn from each other. Bob created the annual symposium, which was a series to reflect on and explore critical, critical issues in philanthropy, and that tradition continues today. This past year, the, the Women's Philanthropy Institute hosted a symposium that had uh, participants from six different continents and many, many different countries, both practitioners and scholars alike. Bob was among the first to see the need for serious research about philanthropy and the nonprofit sector and an early leader of that moment. In a few moments, you'll hear from Virginia Hodgkinson, uh, who will share her thoughts about this shortly. But she and Bob were really the forerunners of, of the idea of rigorous research in philanthropy and helped to plant the seeds for today's enormous and burgeoning body of research about philanthropy and how to practice it effect effectively. Bob oversaw the center's granting of dissertation research funds to scholars in, at IU and at other universities around the world. On his watch, the center was the first US host for the International Conference of Research on Voluntary and Nonprofit Organizations. During Bob's service, the fundraising school became known as the leading provider of training in ethical and effective fundraising. It convened the first Executive Leadership Institute, or ELI, in partnership with what is now the Association for Fundraising Professionals. It also created a certificate in fundraising management, which has been awarded to thousands of nonprofit professionals over the years. Despite these remarkable accomplishments while Bob was the executive director, Bob was not one to rest on his laurels. In later years, he continued to inspire by example, contribute to scholarship and thought in philanthropy nationally as Professor Emeritus and a senior research fellow at the center. Perhaps most importantly, he continued to advise and counsel the center, its students, and colleagues. Bob's influence is very important to us today in many respects. We see it in our ongoing values of our students from around the world who, place, who are in our master's program. The MA draws on Bob's charge that those educated in philanthropy must be, quote, public teachers, helping others think about the complex issues and draw their own conclusions. The master's program its scope is global now, with international students becoming public teachers in home countries. We see his influence in the, first, in the world's first Bachelor's of Arts in Philanthropic Studies degree program as well, which teaches undergraduates not just to take action, but to consider meaning, value, and ethical responsibility implicit in philanthropy. And this must form the foundation for action. We see his leadership in the center's thriving research program that increases the understanding of philanthropy and improves its practice. Our growing international work is also grounded in Bob's principles. He taught us the importance of learning from international colleagues, as well as our obligation to help build a civil society around the world. Still, this legacy of which he is proudest is the students he loved, challenged, and taught, and inspired. They are now scholars teaching and researching the field he helped create. They are compassionate, reflective professionals and volunteers leading social change around the world. They are leaders inspiring and instilling values of thoughtful, reflective, ethical philanthropy into colleagues and future generations. Bob changed their lives so they could change the lives of others. We are grateful for Bob for building the Center on Philanthropy into the go-to place for philanthropic thought and education because the opportunities to serve others that present us every day we honor his immeasurable impact on our field, 
we celebrate his remarkable life, well lived, as we carry with us and share the many lessons.